So, uh, welcome everybody uh, on the Bitcoin meetup. Uh, actually, this is the last Bitcoin meetup before uh, Hackers Congress, uh, the yearly biggest event uh, of Parallel Polis. And it is also uh, my last meetup which I organize. I've been organizing uh, Bitcoin meetups here for three years, so it already makes like 130 events, so quite a lot of them. And uh, today I would like to uh, welcome here Pontus and Ulrika. Uh, it is a, about a month ago that we have uh, here Gilly, who uh, who present herself like digital nomad on Bitcoin. And uh, uh, there uh, I also uh, met again Pontus and Ulrika, and uh, I spoke to them about their journeys uh, on Bitcoin because they are uh, Bitcoin nomads too. Uh, they sold all their, all their stuff uh, like two and a half years ago, and uh, they uh, devoted themselves uh, to to travel around the world on Bitcoin or using also Bitcoin. Uh, meet with uh, Bitcoin uh, enthusiast and uh, Bitcoin community and uh, to write about their experience and also uh, teach uh, teach uh, the newcomers uh, about Bitcoin. And today uh, they will share their experience with us. So Pontus Elmerica, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Mm. And uh, one more thing to add. Uh, I don't know if questions are allowed during your speech, but uh, use only uh, the microphone, uh, raise your hand, and I will uh, give you a microphone because we are streaming, and without the mic, uh, nobody can hear you. Yeah, and it's better if you take the questions afterwards for us. If it's okay with you. Yes. Oh, so uh, thank you for coming and uh, want to listen to us. So as Martin said, my name is Ulrika and this is my better half uh, Pontus. And uh, we are here today to talk about us, uh, why we chose Bitcoin as our primary currency and also why we want to try to opt out from the current economic system. Um, so this is us in India, uh, like two years ago. Um, so the layout of the talk, it's talking about us and uh, the current economical system and Bitcoin and the cryptocurrencies is huge topics. So we'll do our best to keep this short and simple and instead leave room for any questions that you might, might have after the presentation. So our talk will be about who we are, uh, our background, why we choose uh, uh, Bitcoin, and uh, why the current system, economic system, is something that you want to uh, opt out from. And we also want to end our talk with uh, our current lifestyles and uh, reasons for leaving Sweden. Um, so who are we? Uh, we're the persons behind the freedom-oriented travel blog Ankur på Vift. And in English this means uh, ducks on the loose. And Anchor also is the short form for anarcho-capitalists in Swedish. Uh, so I'm the person that are uh, the writer behind this blog, and uh, we're using it, uh, uh, this blog as a diary about us, uh, our lifestyle, and the people we meet along the way. Um, Pontus is the person behind the website Start Using Bitcoin which is an educational website about Bitcoin. Uh, he's also one of the authors uh, behind the 100-page the research report called Blockchain Decentralized Trust, which was published uh, last year in collaboration with the Swedish Entrepreneurship Forum. And the QR codes to the different sites will be up here on the presentation in the end of our talk. Uh, if you want to take a closer look on what we're doing. So, 
we met in 2009-2010, while we were both working as PhD students in Lin Linköping, Sweden. And me, with a background in biomedicine, doing research about cell biology, electrophysiology, and neurobiology. And Pontus, with a background in engineering, doing research about uh, virology and epidemiology. Um, we discovered that we had more in common than the, our taste for adventures. Uh, we both wanted to learn about uh, or understand how the world works. And that led us to a path researching about political and economical systems. We found Bitcoin in 2011 and we started to go down the rabbit hole in 2012 when we really want, started to investigate the current economical systems and, um, and alternatives. Uh, we did form a workshop with a few of our friends in Linköping so we could educate ourselves about uh, the systems. Um, in 2013, we helped friends to start up uh, our local Bitcoin meetup in Linköping. So join them on uh, meetup.com if you ever find yourself in uh, Linköping. Uh, and 2014 was a really interesting year for us uh, when we came to the conclusion uh, that anarcho-capitalism was the closest an ideology could come to how we viewed a better world. Um, we also finished our PhDs in the end, and in the end of 2014 we, saw, we had a gar garage sale and sold all of our st stuff. Uh, we started our travels uh, in February 2015. And finding out about uh, Bitcoin was a big deal breaker for us. Uh, the first time we heard about Bitcoin was from an article by Rick Falkvinge that he published on his webpage in May 2011, where he explained why he invested all his savings and all the money he could borrow in Bitcoin. Rick Falkvinge is well known to us as the founder and former leader of the Swedish Pirate Party. So this prompted us to look into Bitcoin thoroughly. So we have been planning and saving money from the, for this trip uh, from the start of our relationship. But how and why we travel have changed while our view of politics and economics have changed. So first, here, uh, it was about seeing and experiencing the world. And it's still partly about that. But when 2015 came, uh, our travel plans had shifted to find, to find like-minded people and see if we could find a place in the world that suited us. So uh, we have never made any long-term travel plans. Uh, our, we travel to places we find interesting and we try to meet up with Bitcoin enthusiasts and freedom-minded people. So we are far away from uh, being all over, all over the world, as you can see. Uh, so we, we will tell you about a few of the places we have managed to visit so far. So most Bitcoin meetups have been in Asia. And so Bangkok, here, here they are. Uh, has regular meetups every Monday, and they are, are around 25 to 50 people on the, each time on these meetups. And like the Swedes we are, always being on time, we came early, so this picture doesn't really represent the meetup that we went to. And Ubud in Bali uh, has a big expat community with digital nomads interested in cryptocurrencies. And Ubud in Ubud, uh, is the first co-working space, co space in town where you can find a Bitcoin ATM and weekly Bitcoin meetups, which they are streaming live on a YouTube channel called The Filter. Uh, there are at least three other cryptocurrency co-working spaces in Ubud that we know of. Uh, the smallest Bitcoin meetup uh, we've been to was in Phnom Penh in Cambodia. Uh, where we went to Steve's Bitcoin Cafe, which of course accepts Bitcoin. And the guys in Kuala Lumpur 
uh, were really great. Uh, they welcomed, uh, welcomed us by arranging an extra Bitcoin meetup just for us because we wouldn't be around visiting the regular meetup. And they claim to be around 25 people visiting their Bitcoin meetups. And in India, uh, we visited uh, one, of, uh, Bitcoin, uh, one of India's uh, Bitcoin exchanges. Uh, and we also met up with libertarians in India, both in Bangalore and in Mumbai. We also met up with the... Uh, no, see here. There. Uh, libertarians in Singapore. And it was there we heard about Parallel Nepalese for the first time. And we knew that we wanted to come and visit you someday. So we went to Central America. And our mission here was to go to the 2006 version of Anarchapulco. And in, a, and in, a, in, a, in Acapulco. And we met up with like-minded people. Uh, and it was here we first heard about Hackers Congress from uh, Pavel Luptak. Uh, and at Anarchapulco, we also got the chance to listen to Ton Weiss, uh, who will be one of the speakers at the Hackers Congress this weekend. So we can highly recommend to go and listen to him if you have a ticket to the Congress. And they also have meetups, regular meetups, like in Mexico City, in Cancun, in Costa Rica, etc. But we didn't have time to visit them this time around. So that's for every, everything. We haven't been able to go to all Bitcoin meetups that are in the area we are in when we travel. But uh, we try to visit those we can. So Power Luptak was the reason we ended up here last, at last year's Hackers Congress. And we had a really good time, so that's why we're here right now talking to you and going to the Congress again. So in Sweden, Pontus has been uh, speaking to, uh, to uh, Swedish-speaking audiences in Stockholm three times last year. But we still haven't been able to go to a regular Bitcoin meetup in Stockholm yet. That's too bad. So we also attended the Corex conference this summer on Malta, uh, where we met a growing Bitcoin community that want to turn uh, Malta into a Bitcoin island. So if you go to Malta, you should be able to uh, go in the, on a regular meetup that they have every week. So there, are, there is a lot more going on in Europe. And so far, we are far away from meeting most fellow Bitcoiners in Europe, but hopefully... Uh, we can do so uh, in the in the future. So, this was a really short version of our two and a half years uh, of travels. So now we want to turn the attention to why we want to opt out from the current economic system. And for us, this journey started in 2012 when we decided to try the, uh, to find the answer to the question, "What is money?" Uh, so this is our understanding of um, the history of money. So mon money started with the barter of goods. And the most valuable goods became uh, a form of commodity money, uh, like tobacco, salt, wheat, etc. Uh, where the value of the money was tied to the value of the goods. Uh, over time, uh, precious metals... Uh, became the most valuable form of commodity money and minting of coins became popular and it didn't matter if uh, this, whose signature that appeared on the coin if it was minted in Constantinople or London it was only the weight of the pre precious metal that mattered so banks was created and that offered to safely store the precious metal money and as proof that the bank owed you money, you were giving, given a paper bill as a receipt. And over time, people started to pay uh, each other with the paper bills instead of going to the bank to get their precious metals. So then central banks was created in most, most countries that took monopoly on printing new paper bills backed by gold or silver. 
meaning that you still had the right to go to the bank and get your gold in exchange of the paper bill. So paper bills backed by gold is called the gold standard. Uh, but the connection between bills and gold was finally cut in 1971 when the United States, in effect, defaulted on their loans to other countries. Uh, si since then, we have had a fiat monetary system uh, where money can be created out of thin air and has no backing of scarce physical resource. And the first... Uh, electronic debit and credit cards uh, appeared on the market during the 1950s. And, uh, <coughs> sorry. Um, and today we're using much more credits as money than central bank issued paper bills and coins. And in 2009, as you all know, hopefully, came Bitcoin. So you can say um, that the evolution of money has made money more and more abstract and with less direct, uh, direct connection to specific physical resources. And in the history of money, the current system that we have today, the fiat money system, is the only one primarily debt-based it is also a system where inc we increasingly need to the, needs the permission from intermediaries to be able to use it at all. So to understand the current economic system, you need to understand the theories of John Maynard Keynes. He was a British economist that launched his economic theories in 1936. And his theories had a extremely big influence on the world. So according to Keynes, uh, the level of unemployment was caused by the lack of overall spending in the economy. So to stim stimulate the economy, people should consume more. So Keynes thought that to increase consumption, the central banks should lo lower interest rate to make it cheaper to borrow for consumption. Uh, the state should borrow money to invest in large infrastructure projects to increase employment. So Keynes theories, theories became very popular among rulers because them, it gave them the authority to central plan the economy. So his theories were quickly spread and uh, in schools and in government institutions. So based on Keynesianism, the central banks control the amount of money and credits in the economy today. And central banks control the amount of credits indirectly by regulating the in interest rates. And the central banks control the amount of money directly uh, by the printing press or by digitally create new money. Uh, creation of new mo money dilutes the value of uh, the currency. So in the Roman Empire, uh, the state created more and more money by diluting the silver con content in the coins. This resulted in the Roman denarius losing all of its silver coin content over a period of 250 years. For central banks today, they only need to print more money, or print. Uh, due, to the con <coughs> due to the constant increase of new money in the economy, the US dollar has lost 96% of its value the last 100 years. And the current 2% inflation goal of central banks uh, means that they have the explicit goal of reducing the purchasing power of the currency by 50% in 35 years. And during a normal lifetime of 50 years, that means that the, uh, 70 years, sorry, that means that the currency will lose 75% of its value. So this inflation 
is in effect a hidden tax on all money. And the consequences of this fiat money system will Pontus now tell you more about. Okay, thank you very much, Ulrika. Uh, so now I will continue to talk about our uh, current understanding of how the economy works. So all economic transactions consist of a buyer that exchanges either money or credit with the seller for goods, services or financial assets. And money has a value in itself. So therefore it can be used as payment and money is not somebody else's debt. But credit is created through debt and a promise to pay in money in the future. And the prices for goods, services and financial assets depends on the total amount of money and credit in the economy. And any nominal amount of money in society is enough for a fully functional economy. And if the amount of money in society were to double overnight, that would, only mean, that would not mean that the prosperity of goods and services would double. Uh, the only effect would be that the prices of existing goods and services would double. So credit is not money, but it can be used to buy goods, services and financial assets, but only as long as people believe that the debt will be paid in the future. And when a lender loans money to a borrower, credit is created. And the credit is both an asset for the lender and a liability for the borrower. And when the borrower in the future repays the money, with interest of course, then the credit disappears again. So both the asset and the liability disappears. And in the economy today, about 97% of what people normally call money, like the money in people's bank accounts, are actually credits. And uh, the real money, if you can call it real today, because it's not backed by anything, but is only a few percent consisting of central bank bills and coins. So the Keynesian school wants people to borrow money and go into debt. But there is a real problem with that because loans create cycles. And the reason for this is that by taking a loan, you can consume more than you produce temporarily, but at the expense of having to consume less than you produce in the future when you pay back the loan. So when we take a loan, what we are really doing is borrowing from our future self. And Borrowing of money creates credit, and that means that the total amount of money and credit in the economy increases. And one person's increased possibility to spend leads to another person's increased income. And people who get a higher income become more creditworthy and can borrow more money so they can consume more. So that means that other people get a higher income. And this cycle continues upward toward higher growth and higher level of debts until people need to repay their debt and the cycle turns down again. And the short cycles that this creates last about five to eight years and continues over and over again over several decades. And the reason for this uh, synchronicity in these uh, cycles is of course that it is the central bank that manipulates the interest rates to stimulate the economy or to cool down the economy. 
<clears throat> but the top and the bottom of each of these cycles ends with higher growth and higher levels of debt and falls. And they are now unable to pay back on their loans. And when this happens, everybody is forced to sell simultaneously. Uh, so that this leads to prices crashing. And the stock market collapses and political tension rises. And the economy enters a deep depression. So with this view on the current economic system, you can probably understand why we want to opt out of this. And luckily there exists another system, and in our view a much more sound economical school of thought. And the Austrian school totally rejects central planning and political regulation of the interest rate and amount of currency. Uh, instead, it advocates hard money that can't be controlled politically. And the method used in the Austrian school is called praxeology, and it is based on the subjective values and actions of individuals. And it is a deductive study of human action uh, based on the notion that humans engage in purposeful behavior. And... The Austrian school started with Karl Menger, who had the radical idea that all values are subjective. We are all individuals and we all have subjective values. And then he was followed by Bern Bawerk, who made the observation that people always prefer current consumption over future consumption. And this is what is called time preference. And this is very important to understand, to understand why we have and why we need interest rates in the economy. And then we have Ludwig von Mises, who systematized uh, the discoveries and methodology of his predecessors and made large contributions to monetary theory and something that can be called the socialist calculation problem. problem. Another very famous Austrian economist is uh, Friedrich von Hayek, and he is most known for his studies on the use of knowledge in society and the Austrian theory of the business cycle about how credit expansion and monetary inflation creates booms and busts in the economy, for which he received the Nobel Prize in economics in 1974. And Keynesians, they claim that monetary inflation is good that increasing the monetary supply is something good. And they claim that uh, price deflation is bad. They don't want to see lowered prices on goods and services because they claim that this incentivizes saving instead of consuming, which they think is bad. And it makes it more expensive to borrow. And borrowers' real debts increases with time. And Austrians, they have the complete opposite view. Austrians claims that price deflation is good. Uh, they cl claim that falling prices is a good thing, that it is a beneficial consequence of technological progress and working competition in the markets. And Austrians think that monetary inflation is bad. They don't want to see a total uh, uh, increase in the total monetary supply because they say that this is the main reason for the business cycles, the booms and busts in the economy, that it leads to malinvestment of capital, and that it redistributes wealth and purchasing power. And it primarily redistributes, re redistributes wealth and purchasing power from savers to consumers. So this uh, destroys capital in the long run. And the monetary policy of Bitcoin is based on the Austrian school, the notion of hard currency that can't be politically controlled. And as you all know, Bitcoin ha has a fixed currency supply of 21 million. But uh, currently, the monetary infl inflation in Bitcoin is about 4% per year. Uh, but this is because we are in a bootstrapping phase where this is needed. 
and in 2020 the inflation will halve to 2% and there is a halving of the inflation rate in Bitcoin every four years, as I'm sure you know. But the important thing is that everybody in the economy knows that there will never be more than 21 million Bitcoins in existence. So now I'd like to do a thought experiment about what properties a perfect monetary system should have and compare these properties against fiat money, gold and Bitcoin. And according to us, a perfect monetary system should be decentralized. There should be no central entities or special interests that are able to control, regulate or manipulate the system. It should be global and there should be no regional limitations. It should be fair, so that everyone should have the same access to the system and be able to use it on the same terms. It should be permissionless. Everyone should have full access to the system and be able to use it without asking anyone's permission. It should be voluntary to use any monetary system you like and to create and develop new ones. And it should be totally free competition between all of the different monetary systems. And it should also be anonymous, so that transactions should be able to be done totally anonymously without the need to disclose any details to third parties. And the perfect monetary units in this system should be limited and in a known amount. amount. It should be infinitely divisible and infinitely durable. They should be easy to move and easy to store, easy to verify and impossible to counterfeit. And they should be fungible so that each unit of the currency is valued equally as every other unit of the currency. It's, and it shouldn't be any history to the units of the currency. So, today's fiat currencies fit very few of these properties. It gets a half point on anonymous because cash is still anonymous. But all of the digital current transactions that we, we do in the fiat monetary system is not an anonymous. And uh, fiat currencies are perfectly fungible. And that is because we have laws that protect the fungibility of uh, fiat money. So even if some banknotes, for instance, were involved in a crime, those banknotes are still valued the same as all the other banknotes in, ex in existence. And of course fiat money has a very widespread use in the world today, even though we have different fiat money systems in different countries. So gold fulfills a few more of these properties. It is decentralized, it's global, it can probably be used very anonymously, even though it's probably very difficult if you want to have any bigger values of gold that you want to buy things with. It has a limited and known amount, even though it increases by a few percent every year as more gold is dug out of the ground. And gold is infinitely divisible and infinitely durable, and it's fungible. Okay. Question, why it's not fair? Uh, it's, yeah, that's a good question. Maybe it should be, I don't know. But it's, it's very difficult to use uh, gold in, uh, in uh, monetary transactions. So it's easy for governments and others to crack down on the use of gold as, as money and as store of value. Even in some countries you have taxation on gold and things like that. So, so for that reason, I, I, I don't think it's fair. <laughs> uh, and, of course, gold is fungible because you can always melt it down uh, and uh, cast it into new coins and new bars and things like that. And it, gold has a quite a widespread use in the world today, even though it's not used as money uh, for uh, normal transactions. It's used for much larger transactions between states and things like that. And Bitcoin... Uh, fulfills many more of these properties. And where it doesn't get full score is on anonymous, but because as you all know, we have a blockchain where all the transactions are stored for all of eternally, eternity, hopefully. And you can do network analysis and stuff like that to, to connect, connect different transactions with each other and so on. 
Uh, and Bitcoin is not perfectly fungible, and that is because it's not anonymous and because we have no laws that protect the fungibility of Bitcoin. And, of course, in the world today, Bitcoin doesn't have a widespread use, but that might change in the future. And Bitcoin also has another property, uh, and that is that transactions are programmable. Transactions can be executed automatically in predetermined ways, and this can be used to create smart contracts. So, <clears throat> with Bitcoin, it is possible for people to have full sovereignty of their money. With Bitcoin, you can have full control of your money without having to trust any third parties or having to rely on the permission of intermediaries like banks. And there is no possibility for censorship of transactions or confiscation of uh, funds or accounts. Uh, and there are, are no central parties that can control the amount of currency or manipulate the interest rates. Uh, and it's not possible for governments to perform any kind of hidden or automatic taxation of Bitcoin. And the way we envision the future is something like this. So imagine that we are 10 to 30 years into the future, and Bitcoin is the primary global currency and have found a stable valuation based on supply and demand. So let's say that in this scenario, we have a 10% economic growth per year in the global economy as a whole. What this would mean is that prices on goods and services would decrease on average by 10% per year. So to have savings in Bitcoin is like investing in a global index fund, the value of which increases as the global economy grows. So this means that everyone in society have access to a very safe form of saving just by holding Bitcoins. And as a thought exercise, you can try to calculate what the value of one Bitcoin would be in this future scenario, if it comes true. So we think that this quote summarizes the history of money until now very well. There are three eras of currency, commodity-based, politically-based, and now math-based. And now, finally, we want to tell you a few things about our current lifestyle and reasons for why we do not see a future for us in Sweden. So we, we now live, li live a nomadic, minimalistic lifestyle without being residents in any country. Uh, and we don't have any plans to settle down anywhere yet. We carry our possessions in two carry-on backpacks that are about seven kilos each. This means that we can travel with almost all airlines in the world without any checked-in luggage. Uh, we have a private medical insurance from IMG that is called Global Fusion that provides us with uh, medical care all over the world if we would need it. And it costs about 50 euro per person per month. Uh, and the reason for leaving Sweden is that Sweden is a very socialist country. It's very high taxes, and the taxes are getting higher and higher, while the educational system and the healthcare system is getting worse and worse, which is not at all surprising for us, given the incentive structure for tax-funded services. Uh, but the strongest reason why we do not see a future for us in Sweden is because homeschooling is totally forbidden. Uh, and attendance in public schools under the single state curriculum is obligatory. And if you don't put your children in school, in the state um, schools, uh, first you get high fines and then they kidnap your children. So if we get children in the future, uh, we don't want them to go to the Swedish school. Uh, we think it's a big waste of time. 
So basically what we're trying to do is to find freedom in an unfree world and through Bitcoin and by voting with our feet, we hope to achieve this. So thank you very much for your attention and now we're happy to take some questions. And uh, here are our websites again if you want to check them out and also our Twitters. Uh, so thank you, Ulrika and Pontus, for a uh, very nice uh, review of uh, Keynesian thoughts, Austrian thoughts, and and uh, generally uh, anarcho your anarcho-capitalist uh, ideas. Uh, I have to say that uh, my journey was nearly the same. That uh, I first uh, discovered Austrian School of Economics after playing some markets like speculated over F, uh, foreign exchanges and so on. Then I started thinking how it works, discovered financial system, and then uh, I went into why economists didn't see uh, the big crisis in 2008. And I discovered that they, there were some, uh, some uh, economists who saw it, but it, uh, they, it weren't mainstream economists. So uh, what do you think about mainstream view uh, of, the, of the financial crisis in 2008? Uh, yeah, that's a big question. But uh, I think generally the uh, economic schooling, like the economy that you, uh, they teach in a university all over the world is very Keynesian. And... Uh, so I think it's a very corrupt way of looking at the economy. Yeah, and uh, uh, generally they, they tell us that uh, nobody could saw what is coming. Uh, are they lying or they just, uh, they just are so blind that uh, they can uh, tell truth to themselves? Uh, most most of uh, the mainstream media or the high-profile econom economists, yeah. yeah, yeah, they were just laughing at the people who were alarmists back in 2006. Like, for instance, Peter Schiff was one of them who was really uh, trying to be open, publicly open and discussing the possibility of the house bubble mar market in the United States. But most of them just laughed. Yeah, uh, Peter Schiff was also one of my like teachers. I listened to his uh, Schiff radio for two or three years. Uh, do you know why he's so against Bitcoin? <laughs> he's a famous gold seller. Yeah. Uh, but exactly. Uh, I think uh, probably he doesn't completely understand Bitcoin, and he he is also very invested in his gold businesses. So, he, yeah. Yeah, that will be uh, probably uh, the answer. Uh, any question uh, from the public here? Well, I'm really interested in your views about loans. You, you said that loans are that you said that loans are bad because you, uh, you, you consume uh, in the near future and and you lose it in the long, long term. And you said that Bitcoin is good because it has a fixed amount of a fixed amount of uh, you know units or money or currency. And um, what do you stop uh, to give loan to someone in Bitcoins? And of course, if you give loans to someone, you need a kind of interest rate because you have a risk, and you you cannot use your money. So I'm interested in your point. Yes. Uh, loans in general are, are not bad if they are used for investments uh, that makes a profit. But loans for consumption is really bad, like host loans for, for buying a house or a car or electronics or, or something like that. And uh, I think today it's, uh, it's very dangerous to make loans in, in Bitcoin because the price is so volatile and 
the price of Bitcoin tends to go up. But yeah, in the long term, it's no problem. Uh, if if Bitcoin finds a, a stable price level, it's it's no problem at all to make loans in Bitcoin. I would say, but if you want to make uh, loan money to someone in Bitcoin today, you better make sure that they have uh, income in Bitcoin as well, so that they are making a profit in Bitcoin. Just I would like to react. I think if if there is an interest rate it has to have an increasing money supply because no no okay, okay. <laughs> we will discuss it no but you but the interest rate is just a time preference uh, thing if uh, i hold uh, money that i don't use but i want to but i could use it anywhere and then uh, you want me to loan them out, loan them out to you i want to have something in return so i so i don't um, lose anything in this in this uh, situation because I can use my money and spend it or save it in any other way. But if I see that I can uh, have something to win by lending it out, like an interest rate, uh, so I, I will be getting more money back in the future, then it's uh, um, possible for having uh, to, uh, like a loan system. Uh, it's yeah. worth it for worth yeah. it for Co me. Common objection to 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 this is that when you have interest rate, uh, the inter uh, you lend the base, and uh, you need to be returned uh, the base uh, plus the interest rate. So uh, when you apply this uh, like uh, straightforward in straightforward way, uh, you can uh, come to that you need growing. Uh, uh, growing supply of money, otherwise the, you can't have interest rate, which is false. Uh, hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You need. You need. If you borrow money, you need to do it for something profitable. Like if you borrow money for your education, for instance, it has to pay off so that you have a, get a higher paying job in the future. Or if you borrow money for growing apples, let's say, or having a farm or something like that, it. it if, if you grow apples, you, you get kind of an interest rate by the new apples that you get. So that is what covers your, your loan, so to speak, so that you can pay back on your loan plus interest. Yeah, uh, we can discuss it. Uh, uh, I, I can recommend uh, yeah. looking at Khan Academy. They have a really, really good videos on, on banking and how, how interest rates works and fractional reserve banking and stuff like that. Uh, and they, they only use apples and gold to illustrate this. So you don't need a growing monetary supply. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about uh, Rick Falkvina, who you uh, mentioned, because I heard about him in 2011 too, and it was, uh, Bitcoin was about 20. He announced that he sold, uh, all. He, he invested everything, what he owned into Bitcoin, but then Bitcoin went to uh, two dollars per uh, uh, two dollars per Bitcoin, and I haven't heard of him like half a year. So uh, uh, it need it needs to be uh, said that uh, it 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 wasn't always uh, safe to put all your wealth into Bitcoin very quickly. So. Uh, was it your case, or you uh, came out uh, like happy or uh, lucky? Uh, well, first of all, it's probably very unwise to put all of your money, uh, like all of your savings and every all the money you can borrow into to one asset. So I, I would never recommend that. So only put whatever you are willing to be able to lose into Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Uh, but for Rick Falkving, uh, the way I understand it is that he bought uh, Bitcoin when it was about three dollars, I think, and he had an article quite recently when where it was said that he had achieved what he said in 2011, which is a 1,000 x increase of his investment. Uh, so he didn't uh, he didn't sell in no. the in the. Uh, no. 
No, I don't think so. But uh, I'm, <laughs> I can't be sure, of course, but I don't think so. And that's, the, of course, the most important thing with Bitcoin is to hold it or hoodle it, as the famous meme is. So, yeah. So that kind of divides uh, the people okay. who, who, in my mind, understand Bitcoins from those who mm -hmm. are perhaps mm -hmm. more willing just to speculate. Yeah. So uh, it is generally it is wise uh, in the Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies, since they are growing exponentially, uh, to hold uh, through the through the dips. Uh, anybody has questions for our guests? Yes. Hi. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, did you renounce your citizenship because you said you don't want to go back to Sweden? Right. Uh, did you renounce your citizenship as you said you are not going back to Sweden and you're not planning on to go there anytime soon? So do you still have your citizenship or did you just renounce your permanent address there? The later. So we are still Swedish citizens, uh, but we're, we're not residents in Sweden. And one more question. I wasn't here at the beginning, so maybe you said that, maybe not. Uh, so you travel all the time, and so how do you, do you have an income, or do you just basically live off your savings that you put in Bitcoin, let's say, in 2013? A little bit of both. Uh, so we do some consulting work, like both with... Uh, uh, like the research things that we have done before, like medical research, and also some things in Bitcoin and blockchain technology. Cool. Thank you. Anybody else? No? Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, so am I right that you hold most of your like money in Bitcoin or something? And how do you manage to like use Bitcoin in current world like to pay for everything, like you exchange every time for dollars or something, and then you pay, or you have used some kind of tools to directly use Bitcoin? Yes, we expected this question. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, we use Bitcoin as our primary currency. So you could say that we, like our currency and our country is Bitcoin. So whenever we are in another country, uh, where we can't use Bitcoin directly, we need to exchange our Bitcoin to the local currency. But we, yeah, so uh, we use, for instance, local Bitcoin and we use Bitcoin debit cards also as well. Yeah. And it also depends on where we are. So if we are in Bali, for instance, it's much easier to find restaurants that accept uh, cryptocurrencies. So, and in other places, it is nearly impossible, so it just depends on where we are. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I would like to ask what uh, type of uh, debit card you use, and is it Bitcoin, or you load the fiat currency just you exchanging Bitcoin into, into it? Yes. Um, the one we uh, have used so far is that you you have an account where you put Bitcoin and then you exchange it to a, a fiat money, uh, like a saldo of fiat money, and then you use that with a debit card. So it's, it's not uh, um, exchanged directly as you pay with a card. But as I understand it, there are some cards where it's exchanged directly when you use the card. And you don't have to do it before. Uh, and what uh, card, what uh, uh, issuer you uh, use? The one we have used is Virex, or it was called eCoin before. Mm -hmm. um, has it any particular uh, advantage? Why you choose this, like limits or ease of, I don't know, AML, KYC, <laughs> that you don't have to uh, uh, compromise your privacy? No, I think most cards are the same. So if you only spend a small amount, you're, you don't need to uh, put in your uh, details like KYC. Um, yeah, know your customer and not money laundering laws and things like that. But uh, if you want to spend more like more than a thousand euro or something like that, then you need to do that. So that's not the reason we choose this card. We just looked at all the different cards that was on the market and we thought this was one of the better ones. And uh, 
the exchange rate from for from Bitcoin to a fiat currency is generally three mm-hmm. percent. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, are there any other uh, uh, Bitcoin uh, services that you would recommend? Like you use it daily, like Maps, or I I don't know. No, not really. Ulrika has one. Uh, VPN services. We can. Uh, at least uh, one of our friends uh, is the founder of uh, mulva.net. It's a VPN service that have been accepting Bitcoin since two, 2010. So if we want to do a, like a promotion of one of them, but yeah, so, there so, are more. But, there but are this more. is basically not a Bitcoin service. Uh, it's like a uh, usual VPN service uh, who you can pay uh, in Bitcoin. Yeah, mm. And... Uh, I wanted to uh, ask you, you are traveling uh, like two and a half year. Uh, what changes uh, you saw in the Bitcoin communities during uh, those two years? Because Bitcoin grew uh, like, I don't know, 20 times during that. And uh, if you see uh, something evolving or different, like more people becoming anarcho-capitalists or uh, more uh, Keynesians coming in, but staying like Keynesians, but only using Bitcoin. Uh, any changes? Yeah, I think it's uh, quite a organic growth overall. Like, if you go to meetups and things like that, I don't think so much have changed since, yeah, 2012, 2013. Uh, but on the internet, I think the the growth is is very high. So I, I think it's a ongoing uh, organic growth of the whole ecosystem. And we can uh, the thing we see is that uh, we're getting more messages from friends uh, wanting to know about Bitcoin. The last year or the last half a year. That, yeah, yeah, friends and family. Yeah, yes, and same, same on my side and. Uh, aren't you tired of explaining uh, the basics, uh, uh, like 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 a machine, like uh, all the time? Yeah, <laughs> it actually gets a bit tiring uh, after a few years. But I also have my website, start using Bitcoin, where I can point them. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. One practical. Uh, again, uh, as you travel, as you travel, um, how do you store your Bitcoin? Sorry if, if it's like private. I don't want to like go into your private details. But uh, like, if you travel around the world, so how do, how do you how do you store it? How do you take it from that storage? You use some um, online wallets or or phone wallets or something or Trezor or whatever. And the second question. About uh, other uh, coins, what do you think about? Okay. Yeah, we can take one one at a time. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I like to divide my bitcoins between different methods of storage. So we have both uh, cold storage, like paper wallets, things like that, but also a Trezor. Um, and uh, for just uh, s- smaller amounts, we use wallets on our mobile phones. Uh, yeah. Any, um, any bad experiences or with anything? Uh, uh, yeah, I wouldn't recommend like putting too much uh, of your bitcoins to third parties like Mt. Cox, for instance. I know. <laughs> And, and also on my, on my website, Start Using Bitcoin, on the second article there, I, I write about my philosophy of how you should store your Bitcoins and how you should not store your Bitcoins. Right. Okay. Thank you. And the second part uh, is, is more general. It's um, about the other coins. What do you think? Which coins you possibly use or, or which coins you think will have future? Well, we... I have used Litecoin here at Parallel Police because the transaction fee is a lot less. But today when uh, I wanted to pay with uh, Litecoin with a Jax wallet, it didn't work. So I had to use Bitcoin. 
but generally, I'm kind of a Bitcoin maximalist. I, I think that because of all the network effects, that Bitcoin will win out in the end. Uh, perhaps there will be like a Pareto distribution, so like an 80 20 thing between Bitcoin and uh, other altcoins. Uh, but because of all the network effects, because Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency, uh, it has the highest number of developers and companies and users and security overall and uh, the best decentralization in my view, uh, even though it's not perfect. Uh, so I don't think there are any cryptocurrencies that are uh, like anywhere near being able to replace Bitcoin and I don't think that will happen either. But it, I, I could also say that I think it's very good that there are a lot of alternatives that, and that we have a free competition both between Bitcoin and altcoins and uh, even uh, perhaps different forks of Bitcoin. Yes, I have a question as well. Um, I'm wondering, do you expect any regulation from governments about Bitcoins or if, are you aware about any, yes, any country that for which we have, there are in place some laws to be stick to? Uh, well, most uh, countries and governments uh, want you to pay some tax when you sell Bitcoins. But, uh, and uh, most countries try to regulate like currency exchanges that act as businesses for exchanging between Bitcoin and fiat currencies and things like that. So governments can control uh, yeah, like between Bitcoin and the regulated economic system. But once you are totally in Bitcoin and only using Bitcoin, they, they're not able to regulate it. Uh. Yeah, I, I think uh, the biggest uh, problem of Bitcoin is that it's uh, unregulatable in the nature, uh, which is in direct uh, opposition to our current financial system. And uh, we, have man, uh, we have general financial AML and KYC laws that you have to de-anonymize your customers uh, if you don't trade with them uh, in person. Uh, and with Bitcoin, this is very difficult to do. Uh, so there are many... Uh, many clashes between uh, these two uh, uh, these two systems. I think, uh, yeah? Uh, we like can just take an example of the uh, Bitcoin exchange we visited in India. They also have this no customer regulations on them, but they, what they're doing is a more clever way of storing it. So they, they don't have any of their customers uh, uh, information online, they print everything and then divide all the papers. So if the if the government wants to uh, stick their nose into it, then they just have to uh, figure it out by themselves. They would just give them the uh, all the papers, and then they have to sort them out. And and then they also have a system of um, of uh, trashing it after six months because you can't you don't have to store it for a long time. So some. Uh, Exchanges do are better than others, perhaps on, yeah. on making it hard for the government. Uh, but best example of uh, cryptocurrency regulation is China, which is like each year bringing new new laws what uh, can be used or can be used. Uh, on China, are you worried about a concentration of mining power negatively affecting the future of Bitcoin? Well, as I understand it, uh, probably about 70% of the mining power is in China right now. Mm -hmm. So we will see if this crackdown in China of exchanges will cause the mining power to migrate out of China, perhaps making uh, the Bitcoin mining more decentralized. But of course, it's very worrisome if uh, any single entity has more than 50% of the Bitcoin mining power. So that's very far from ideal. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And can I have one more question? Uh, and <laughs> no, I just forgot what it was. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Yeah, no, I forgot what the question was. Yeah, you forgot the question. Okay, uh, so while you are trying to remember, uh, uh, yeah, the concentration uh, of mining power in China, I think Andreas Antonopoulos uh, addressed this question several times, and he's not worried because first, miners can have more than 50%. But they cannot uh, like change the transactions. They can only send the transaction, and uh, they they might fork uh, they might fork the uh, uh, the network. But uh, they are really like they are not like rulers. They can they can't set new rules because uh, uh, the the nature of Bitcoin is such or those rules that you can. Uh, verify them for the for yourself, and if you see that uh, the what's happening on the network is doesn't match the rules, you just refuse the whole uh, blockchain which is given by these miners. So even when there is a man, ma minority of miners following old rules or traditional rules, uh, it's okay. We don't need the majority. Uh, of course, it's bad uh, for censoring. Thank you. Hello, I want to ask you about your future. What you are planning to do in the future? If you plan to travel a uh, few years and then to stay in some country and about your plans? Uh, we don't have any such plans at the moment. Uh, we don't do long-term plans. Uh, but what we what we have been doing the first year we traveled we traveled it was uh, much more frequently so we changed location every seven, four, four to seven days and occasionally we stayed a week or two but after the first part of, in Southeast Asia and we went over to Central America our travel plans have become more of a really slow traveler and if we find a place we like we stay but then we move on. So um, in Acapulco, for instance, we stayed for three months uh, just because we liked the community there. Um, we really like Prague, so we, we come and go here. You've perhaps seen us before, but um, we really love Bali. So there we were two months this year. Um, and in other places, we stay a few days. If, so... But mostly we do slow travel. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and uh, I have, for me, I have uh, two last questions. So uh, if anybody uh, during these two questions come up with their question, uh, we can stick it uh, into uh, before we end. So uh, uh, my question is, if you have uh, visited uh, countries like uh, Venezuela, India, or China, in the time uh, they were having uh, uh, these financial pressures, like lately in Venezuela uh, is known for uh, growing inflation, which is turning into high um, hyperinflation, and uh, the state is uh, going after the people mining Bitcoin. So if you have any experience from there. No, uh, unfortunately not. Uh, we have not visited Venezuela uh, or we, we have uh, visited India, but that was before the crackdown where they uh, took away the 500 and 1,000 rupee notes and things like that. Uh, but we do know how important those bills were, so we can only imagine uh, what happened on, a, on the small people level when they yeah, just yeah. withdraw it. I don't know if everybody knows that, but in India it's like several months ago, six months ago. Uh, the government decided that uh, the, the, their two biggest bills, like 2,000 rupees and 500 rupees, are bad because of corruption. And uh, I think they decided from one day to another day that they, they will uh, get rid of these uh, banknotes uh, over all India. So it was a great disruption, and uh, many people in India turned... Uh, turned to Bitcoin uh, during uh, these times, so it was uh, a big event for uh, for uh, Bitcoin community too. But uh, mainly, it was uh, a showcase of 
how government can be really dangerous to ordinary people using uh, the financial system. And uh, in Venezuela, it's happening uh, now too. And have you it, it was only a week ago, I think, where uh, one Venezuelan Bolivar was worth the same as one Satoshi. So yeah. one. It's uh, like 100 million of Bolivars Bitcoin. is one Bitcoin now. Mm, yeah. the, other, the other way around, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 100 million of a Bitcoin is one mm -hmm. Bolivar, or even less now, probably. But, um, because in Venezuela, I think they have about an uh, uh, inflation rate of about 2,000% uh, per year. Right. And it's, it will probably increase until the currency is completely gone. Yeah, I uh, read an article that uh, there is a lot of people uh, living on Bitcoin mining. And they, they have like, because the electricity is almost free because it's subsidized from... Uh, uh, from uh, the government and uh, I read one article about a man who gets 50% uh, 80% of his uh, income using Bitcoin mining and only 20% uh, of his ordinary job so for some people in Venezuela right now it's uh, a matter of uh, life and death so and the, the last question uh, is uh, you travel a lot around the world and uh, this, uh, this uh, presentation was a little bit serious, actually. Uh, but I want to ask you about what, f what is the most funniest uh, story of your journey. I, I know you are not ready uh, for such a question. But uh, uh, have you met uh, any, or it doesn't have to be funniest, but what uh, mostly, what is the event uh, what mostly surprised you or uh, some highlight that uh, you would like to mention in the end? Well, we have uh, had a lot of good times, but uh, it's not like any one particular. We, we really liked uh, the community in, on Acapulco. That was really nice. Or Acapulco in Mexico. So we stayed there for three months and mm -hmm. hanged out with a libertarian community there, a growing libertarian community that have moved there, mostly from the United States, but also from other countries. So we had a really good time there. And uh, would you recommend uh, anybody who you met uh, to come here to Prague, like for next uh, Hackers Congress, or uh, just to have him on a Bitcoin meetup? Uh, we recommend everyone that we meet to come here. <laughs> so, okay. so that's what actually we were after we were in we were in in Singapore when we first heard about Parallel Police and Stohoven and all the mischiefs that you were doing. So after that, we were on a Swedish anarcho-capitalist podcast talking about Prague and Parallel Police, even though we ha hadn't been here yet. So that's why Caroline. <laughs> came here first, <laughs> our friend. She heard us on the radio. She is a pioneer for you. Yeah, so she, she came here first, but it was f from uh, us telling her about it. Okay. So uh, Ulrika and Pontus, uh, thank you very much. Uh, if you haven't, uh, if you don't have anything to add, I would like to thank you. And uh, I hope you will have a great time uh, uh, on weekend during, during the Congress. So thank you for coming. Thank you for watching. And uh, hope you see everybody in some time. Goodbye. Thank you very much.